Welcome to Net Present Value, where we explore the intersection of money, meaning, our impact, and the legacy we create. Thanks for being here. Hey, Timo here. Welcome to another episode of NPV. Excited to share with you our 1031 Exchange and Triple Net series. The next several episodes will be related to triple net properties and or 1031 exchanges. And in the future, if you want to access all the episodes in this series, you can go to our YouTube channel, which is Compound Global, and look for the 1031 exchange and the triple net playlist. That playlist will have all the episodes related to this topic. 1031 exchanges and triple net properties have been the main part of our business over the last 15 years and continue to be a huge part. But what we're working on here at Compound Global with our impact investments is bringing some of those same benefits, uh, such as the tax benefits, tax deferral from 1031 exchanges or the passive hands-off, low-risk benefits from triple net and bringing those into the impact investment arena. I hope this provides a lot of value for you. I'm really glad you're here. And as always, interested in any feedback, comments, questions, whatnot, here is my direct cell phone number. Feel free to text me or call anytime, 970-618-4086. Again, 970-618-4086. Enjoy. Hey everybody, Timo here, Thomas Morgan with 1031navigator.com. Hope you're doing well. Thanks for all the people that continue to email and call who have listened uh, to the episodes. I truly, truly appreciate it. I'll have some pretty big closing announcements here, hopefully next week. Uh, $10 million Walgreens in the Southeast and a five-something million dollar CVS up in the Northeast. So I'll fill you more in on those later, uh, but also recently closed a small family dollar and a small pizza hut. Uh, so I'd be happy to give you details on those if you're interested. So just let me know. I can shoot you cap rate info and lease term info, uh, you know, pizza hut credit, you know, who the franchisee was, how big they were, et cetera. You know, maybe I could make that into an episode, but if you wanted to just email me or text me, uh, email is on the website, 1031navigator.com, or you can call or text 970-618-4086. So let me know. Happy to provide uh, the specs on those deals. Also doing a two-tenant deal in Dallas, Fort Worth, uh, $4 million deal right now. Sherwin-Williams is one of the tenants, and then there's a dentist, orthodontist in the other uh, part of the building. And so that's a nice recession-proof type deal. And that, that's a 1031 also. But I'll fill you in on the Walgreens and CVS uh, closings next week once they're done. And then also we'll be posting an episode about a new listing that we just took to market. It's a almost $16 million Walgreens in California. Super r- rare deal. Uh, 18 and a half years left on an absolute net lease. So for today's podcast, I had a good email exchange with a guy and I'm going to protect his identity and his uh, confidentiality. And we're going to call him Dave for the purposes of the podcast. And I have permission from Dave to uh, read these questions on air and then answer them. And I figured it would be helpful to the other listeners out there. So um, I got a a couple emails from Dave regarding a 1031 that him and his family are going to be in coming up here in another month or so. And they have, you know, Dave has a decent amount of real estate experience. He kind of outlined it in the email uh, to me. He's done some lots and some condos. I'm kind of reading his email here while we talk. Um, Done a couple, looks like fix and flips and rehabs, some land deals, stuff like that. And then they're selling a um, industrial deal with uh, zero debt. Uh, We'll just call it uh, just under 5 million for the purposes of the podcast. 
uh, no debt, no mortgage. And what they're doing is looking to 1031 exchange into a passive income producing real estate in order for um, retirement. Um, so his questions, he, he says, my questions come from a place of no experience with 1031 exchanges and or income producing commercial property. But then he gave me a list of some of the deals he's been doing since uh, 2000 and through 2018. So they definitely have experience. And then they gave me some info, which is super helpful about who the you know the entity name is of the seller, um, when the buyer's due diligence period is up on their sale, their 1031 down leg, as we call it, and when the closing uh, will take place. And they've already got their QI or qualified intermediary lined up, which it looks like they're using a, an attorney for that. And they have a lender lined up as well if they'd like to um, exchange over the amount of their um, cash proceeds from the deal. And so I, I want to reach out and say thank you to Dave. And, and that's what we're calling him here. This is what he says in the email. We are reaching out to you to hire your services to find one or two income producing commercial properties totaling up about $5 million. And then he continues, I listened to all of your podcasts on 1031 Navigator. I visited your website and wanted to ask you some of the same questions that you suggested on your podcast and a few others. So first of all, Dave, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for listening one to the podcast, but gee whiz, listening to, uh, all the episodes, I don't even know if I could listen to myself talk that much. <laughs> just just kidding. But uh, I actually have a tendency to do that too. I'm a, I call myself a podcast junkie and um, tend to, you know, when I get turned on to a certain episode or certain topic, you know, I'll essentially listen to all the episodes. I mean, I've, I've listened to 20, 30, 50 episodes continuously over the course of a month on you know certain topics. Um, so what I'm going to do here is just go through Dave's questions one by one and um, answer them the best I can. And as always, I welcome uh, more questions from any of you listeners, and maybe I'll answer them on air. And if not, I'll answer them privately for you. So question number one, how long have you been doing 1031s? Well, I've been in real estate since essentially 2002 when I started a property management business. And then I did brokerage um, for, I think, two or three years before I did my first 1031. And so I think my first 1031 was actually right before I got married, now that I think of it, which was um, summer 2005. So I helped a client who it was a retail guy, shopping center guy, and he was trading out of Arizona. Cap rates were low at the time, you know, right before the recession. Uh, you know, kind of peak market was 2004 through 2007. And he was in Arizona, sold at a low cap rate, and wanted to uh, do something in Colorado at a higher cap rate. So, you know, he had sold at like a sub six cap on a retail deal. And I was able to put him into a six tenant retail deal in Colorado at about an eight cap, if I remember correctly. But that was, gee whiz, 13 years ago. So that was my first 1031. And then I think I did a couple more. And I think my third or fourth one uh, in 2006 was actually a reverse 1031. It was, it was actually a double reverse 1031. Uh, so the Warning curve was steep on that, but actually reverse 1031s are not something to be scared of. Uh, they're actually uh, fairly easy uh, to execute if you have the right people doing it. But uh, that was kind of fun to you know, get experience with um, five. So yeah, 13 years, something like that. So that's how long I've been doing 1031s pretty much today. You know, or over the last five years, probably 80, 90 percent of my business is 1031 exchanges, primarily on the buyer rep side. Question number two, are you a CCIM or an SIOR? So 
you know, I, I call it SIOR or, or I think the, the formal way you say it is SIOR, but no, I'm not a SIOR. Um, I primarily do retail, single tenant. I've, I've done some office. I've done uh, some, you know, decent amount of industrial actually. And I've done a decent amount of multifamily and uh, trailer parks, but um, I don't really do much office and you know don't do much leasing. So I never really saw the benefit of the SIOR. Um, and I work nationally. I don't work in just one local market. I think if all I was doing was industrial and office like in Denver, let's say, or Salt Lake City or LA, then the SIOR would definitely be helpful and come in handy. But uh, to the first part of the question, I am a CCIM, which is, stands for Certified Commercial Investment Member. And that was actually probably one of the best things I did for my career in terms of financial education or you know, financial analysis, market analysis, user analysis, investment uh, decision making. I think I took my first class in Colorado Springs from Steve Price a long time CCIM in, I think, 2005 as well. And I didn't actually complete the designation until 2007. It took a couple of years. Uh, CCIM is considered graduate level education in the field of commercial and investment real estate. You know, the, the classes, each class is pretty much a week long in person, but the, the book for each class is like an inch and a half thick, and they consider each class, I think, to be like a semester of graduate school. And so you, you know, you cram it all in in a week and then, you know, you have to study at night and, and then, you you know, you bring your real world experience uh, to the class as well. Uh, but I I love the networking of CCIM. I've met a bunch of really, really cool people all over the country. In fact, all over the world who all uh, do yeah, they're all in commercial real estate, but they all do different things. You know, I've met developers, I've met investors, of course, brokers, appraisers, MAIs, um, you know, land developers, you know, all sorts of people who, you know, people, these, you know, crazy projects, people doing stuff in Dubai, people doing stuff in South Africa. You know, I had one developer contact me for a big uh, resort in Mexico on the coast that he was trying to develop and get capital for. Uh, the networking has been phenomenal. And, you know, if I need something from someone or have a question about a specific thing, you know, accelerated depreciation or ground leases or IRR, what, you know, whatever it might be, there's all sorts of people I can reach out to in the network. And we have a, a forum uh, that we use uh, that we, I can, you know, reach out, ask a question, and, you know, 20, 30 people will answer. Uh, those questions and and reply with their expertise. So it's not just for brokers; it's for you know, generally financial people or investment professionals uh, who are specialized in commercial real estate. And it's been probably the biggest, uh, I feel like, boon to my career because it's given me the the skills and expertise as well as the confidence to move forward. Uh, you know, knowing I have all that background in education. Uh, you know, to understand the different metrics and you know, cash flow analysis, net present value, um, IRR, you know, after tax, pre-tax, depreciation, all sorts of cool calculations that we do and different financial models that we can put together. Uh, and then, you know, to actually get the CCIM, you have to sit for a comprehensive exam and, um, you know, required two, three days of, of review uh, classes. And then you sit for like, I don't know, five, six hours and just, you know, just your calculator and scrap piece of paper and have to, you know, it's a proctored exam and it's you know, harder than any college exam I took, you know, getting a business degree. Uh, so highly recommend it. And um, it's been super worthwhile. Uh, but, I, you know, I provide all that expertise to my clients and to my own deals and my, you know, the deals I do with my family. So number three, are you a member of local or national organizations? Uh, yeah, so definitely a member of the CCIM Institute. Uh, that's actually a realtor, National Association of Realtor uh, Affiliation uh, you know, group. And um, you know, for my Colorado license, 
I have to belong to a local board, so I belong to the Aspen Board of Realtors, and therefore we also belong to the Colorado Board of Realtors, and then therefore the National Board of Realtors. I don't actually belong to any other organizations right now. I used to uh, belong to the Urban Land Institute, uh, which I think I'm thinking about rejoining. And then I also was, uh, I got the CIPS designation, which is Certified International Property Specialist designation a few years ago. And I was a member of the CIPS community, which was pretty cool because there's a lot of international people you know, doing really, really cool stuff around the world, uh, which was intriguing. And then I also was a member of ICSC, International Council of Shopping Centers, but I'm not anymore. Um, I wasn't really getting benefits, I don't think, from those organizations. You know, I can still reach out to those uh, members, people I've met from those organizations, but it's not like the CCIM community uh, where it's, you know, tight-knit group of people who you can kind of turn to with, you know, you know the expertise and the education, you know, the credibility is there. Um, but, you know, nothing wrong with with uh, a lot of the other uh, groups, you know, the um, there's, I think the Land Institute or, you know, Real, National Realtor Association has a land accredit, accreditation uh, designation that people can get. And, you know, they have residential designations that people can get. Um, I just don't see much benefit for me in, in that. Um, and if I was doing more seller rep or developer rep, I definitely would be a member of ICSC, but I, you know, probably only 5% of my business is seller rep just helping repeat clients. So, uh, number four, what deals are you currently working? Parentheses, we're looking for apartment buildings, class C or better, triple net or absolute net commercial income producing property. So gave you a little rundown at the beginning of the podcast with what I'm working on right now. Uh, two Walgreens, uh, CBS just did a Pizza Hut, just did a Family Dollar, doing a Sherwin Williams deal. Um, also, we're working on a twenty-six million dollar trade requirement right now. A repeat client who I sold the Walgreens to last year is selling uh, two apartment buildings and two pieces of land, and they'll have about twenty-six million to place. It will be about fifty to sixty percent LTV uh, debt on that, depending on how the proceeds shake out. We're actually looking at doing two or three zero cash flow CBSs for the debt requirement and then buying the other deals unleveraged, um, you know, more sexy, long-term, lower cap rate Walgreens or CBS deals. Um, I have one client who's looking at some multifamily stuff right now. I have another one who's looking at some mobile home parks. Um, yeah, I do get calls from clients. And actually, the podcast has generated two calls this year where people call me. They're in their 40s or 50s or even early 60s and ask about triple net and if the triple net properties are right for them or if they should consider it. And usually my answer to that is if you have already accumulated all the capital you want or need to accumulate and you're just looking for cash flow on that capital, then, um, you know, 1030, 1031s and uh, triple net properties are perfect. You know, if you don't need to maximize that annual rate of return or IRR, triple net properties uh, are good. You know, you're at five, six percent cap rate and you throw a little debt on that. You know, you might get maybe a seven or eight percent IRR, you know, maybe up to 10 percent, depending on the spread between the cap rate and the interest rate. But a lot of guys call me and they're, you know, they're like, I'm not really retired. I don't really want to retire. Um, and I actually have some women clients who are the same thing. They don't, you know, they don't want to just sit back and play golf and not, you know, not do anything. You know, a lot of my clients are 70, 80, 90 years old who, they're, you know, they say to me, Thomas, I don't want to be bugged. You know, I don't want a phone call. I don't want to have to send someone out to the roof to fix it. I don't want to, you know, have to paint the parking lot. I don't want to do anything. So, um, you know, find me an absolute net deal. I'm fine with a five cap and we'll set it and forget it for, you know, 15 years, 20 years. And those people say to me, you know, I think I've joked about this on the podcast before, but they say to me, I'm not going to be alive by the time the lease is up anyways. 
So what does it matter to me? So if that's your profile as an investor, then triple net properties are great. You know, if you, if you have all the capital you need and you're just looking to park it, defer taxes, get long-term income, uh, then triple net properties are perfect. But if you are younger or your partners are younger and you have someone one of the, in the partnership or you in particular are willing to, as I say, roll up your sleeves and, you know, get, you know, get your hands dirty a little bit and do a little bit of work, then there's other asset uh, opportunities that are still still fairly passive, but uh, they're not uh, as passive as triple net, but the yields are higher. So like on the two tenant deal I'm selling in the Dallas area, that is a couple purchasing that, a referral from a longtime client. And they are used to being business owners. They're used to uh, being very busy and they didn't want you know, the, a five cap wasn't really that appealing to them. So this deal, we're close to a seven cap and they're assuming the financing at 4%. So they have almost a 3% spread on the financing and they'll have to do a little bit of, you know, kind of contract maintenance with, um, or, you know, maintenance oversight with lawn care and a roofing company and you know, parking lot maintenance, uh, tenant, certain tenant repairs, stuff like that. But for all intensive purposes, the the leases are triple net, but there's you know CAM, common area maintenance to take care of. So they're willing to you know, get a seven cap and it's probably going to be close to a 10% annual IRR when you count in um, principal reduction and uh, you know cash flow, you know, rent increases, stuff like that. You know, maybe even 12% depending on what they sell it for, you know, depending on the disposition of it. Um but that was fine to them. You know, they'll do a cam reconciliation each year and make a few phone calls, send a few letters. You know, they're willing to take that extra, you know, oversight or, you know, risk uh, for that higher yield, which, so I think the cash flow difference on that when we ran the numbers being at like a six and a half, seven cap versus being at like a five, five and a half cap on a four and a half million dollar deal is what we ran the numbers at. And I probably should do a podcast episode on it because the numbers were so fun. I think it was around $50,000 difference in cash flow after debt service. So you, know, you, you tell me, depending on who you are and what kind of work you want to do, what kind of, you know, effort you want to expend, stuff like that is, you know, if it's worth it to you to have a higher cap rate, uh, but have to roll your sleeves up, et cetera. So number five, should I educate myself in a certain area, website, read a specific book while doing the 1031 exchange? Or do you or someone in your office offer explanations or education on how our potential purchase is evaluated? Well, uh, Dave, that's you know essentially what uh, my podcast is about. My blog is about. The CCIM is about, you know, my 15 years of experience. Um you know, doing these deals, you know, over a billion dollars of experience in over 35 states, I think we are right now. Um, so that's my job. You know, that's uh, what I get paid to do. Um, and that's why I, I just did an analysis uh, Monday looking at where my clients come from. And, um, you know, initially my clients come from advertising and content marketing and stuff like that. But uh, the last 26 months, 52% of the number of clients and 58% of my income has come from repeat or referral clients. So if that gives you an idea of kind of the level of service I provide or level of expertise or what kind of deals I'm selling and what kind of deals I pitch uh, to people, you know, my, you know, that, that number would not be that high if I, gave crappy advice or put people in crappy properties. You know, I, I joke with people when I talk to them, I said, you know, if you're going to call me back, you know, two years or three years after you buy a property, I'd, you know, I, I'd rather you call me back and say, Hey, look, you know, my property's doing so well uh, that I want to buy another property or my brother or my sister or my friend that I play golf with wants to buy a property similar uh, to what I have because it's doing so well. You know, I, I don't want someone to call me back in two or three years and say, you know, you sold me a dud. You know, the you know the analysis you ran sucked and the market sucked and the rents sucked. And, you know, you know how that goes. Um, 
So I put a lot of effort up front into only, you know, finding or presenting the deals that, um, you know, make sense and are going to be good long-term investments. Um, you know, they're deals that I would either buy myself or, you know, put my family, uh, in, you know, in-laws and, uh, brother-in-laws and sister-in-laws into, um, you know, that I want my kids to own, uh, cause that's, you know, kind of the nature of income real estate is it's, you know, location, 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 and you can't sell it, um, you know, to, you know, depending you know, if the location's crappy, you're not going to be able to get your, your money out and you want to make sure those real estate fundamentals match the you know, triple net, you know, tenant fundamentals that we find in the net lease space. You know, there are some other resources. There's, I don't think there's really any brokers or let's say 1031 real estate investment advisors blogging or podcasting or doing the stuff I'm doing. And so if, if any of, you know, if I have competitors out there or brokers out there, you know, thinking about getting into the business, I actually welcome, um, you know, your blogging, your podcasting, you know, your calls, your questions. And, you know, it'd actually be more fun if there was more of a dialogue into these deals and what are the good deals? What are the bad deals? You know, what are the, the points, the finer points of it? But I don't really know if anybody on the, you know, the real estate brokerage or advisory side doing what I'm doing. You know, some of the big brokerages have some blogs and, you know, there's you know, a couple guys, Michael Bull, who's a CCIM, um, Howard Klein, you know, Duke Wong, there's some guys who are real big on social media and have some, have their own podcasts, but they're more commercial real estate in general oriented. I don't really know of anyone else doing 1031 specific or triple net specific uh, podcasting. You know, there's a few or blogging for that matter. There's a few one-off you know, episodes and shows, you know, like you could go to bigger pockets. Uh, they have a great podcast. Um, I actually listened to a triple net podcast on a guy in New York city who does uh, a New York city multifamily podcast. So there's some one-off shows you could listen to. If you know, you do a search in the iTunes store or Stitcher or Google play for um, triple net or 1031 there's a lot of actually old content on YouTube from, from people doing stuff like four or five years ago, you know, but not too many people doing new stuff, but I would actually welcome that because I I'd love to have those people on my show and have a dialogue between what they like, what they don't like, you know, why, you know, they're selling certain deals, why their clients are buying certain deals, etc. Um, there, there are some actually good blogs from the 1031 qualified intermediaries, uh, IPX and, I don't know if you say it, Exeter or Exeter. Uh, they're both QIs, and uh, I think Asset Preservation might have a little bit of a blog, uh, but uh, IPX has some really good, and, and um, Exeter has some, they, they both have really good in-depth technical 1031 articles about the 1031 exchange process and a lot of questions that come up with like 1031 exchange partnerships, reverse exchanges, holding periods, uh, construction, 1031 exchanges, stuff like that. So, you know, that there's some good reading and good, uh, things there, but I also don't think there's too many books on the subject either. Uh, there's David, uh, Solomon's book, a uh, little red book of triple net investing. And then there's a couple other guys who have some Kindle books and eBooks, stuff like that. So you could definitely check out the Amazon store. Uh, but basically that's my job. You know, so going back to this question, number five, should you educate yourself by all means you should educate yourself and, um, you know, do what you need to, to make an informed real estate decision. Uh, you know, that, that's really where wealth is built is, you know, knowing what you do know and what you don't know, and then finding people to help you fill in the blanks, uh, between, you know, what you, you know, on what you don't know or don't know yet. Um, so number six, I noticed that you asked me if I was representing my family as her broker or agent. I just want to know why and if that affects our relationship, deal preference, etc. cetera. Um, it does and it doesn't. It does if, if you're trying to act as buyer's broker and um, collect a fee, then it definitely affects our relationship because that's how I get paid. I essentially work for my clients for free and then I get paid by the listing broker and or the seller. Um, so if there's a buyer's broker involved, then you should just go out and uh, shop 
you know, listings and talk to the listing brokers and whatnot who represent the sellers and, you know, make your own decision in the marketplace. Um, if you want my expertise, guidance, knowledge, experience, stuff like that, then I work as buyer's broker and, uh, that's how I get paid. You know, it doesn't cost you anything, but then, you know, I present the deal and, I uh, close the deal for you and I help you through all asp aspects of the financing, title work, inspection, due diligence, everything like that. Um, I do require people to sign a non-exclusive agreement um, that just kind of outlines how the process works and who does what and when and you know, covering you know, when I present a property to you, you know, if you've seen it somewhere else, uh, how you respond to that and whatnot. Uh, I don't require people to sign an exclusive agreement because I don't think people should be married uh, to a broker. I think you get bad advice, you get lazy brokers, and you end up not getting as high of level of service. Whereas if you have two or three brokers working for you or one good one on a non-exclusive basis, you know you can still go out and find deals. Uh, but it kind of creates a level of competition where you know that may the best person win the business and send you the best deal that matches your investment objectives. So, you know, we can talk about that more in person when we, we talk on the phone later this week. But, um, yeah, basically we need to outline that because it covers how and who gets paid and, and when, et cetera. And then number seven, kind of the same question, how will you be getting paid by the listing agent and or by my family, the buyer? Um, no, I, I don't ever seek compensation from the buyer. You know, I, I call myself the best deal in town because I don't cost you anything. I don't requ require any deposits. I don't require any upfront fees. I don't require any hourly. Um, and I don't think I've ever had a buyer pay my commission. I had one client who I, he was a buyer client, but then I helped him with a sale that he was negotiating with someone he knew and they weren't reaching an agreement. So he, he had me jump in the deal. I didn't ask for a commission. And then he called me a day before closing and said, you know, you've been so helpful that I'm going to you know, pay you a $40,000 commission, something like that, which was, you know, really uh, showed the character of this client and who he was. And, um, you know, one of my favorite clients, but I've never, ever had to get paid from uh, a buyer client. So the, the seller and or the listing broker pays uh, my, my fee. And that's they They always budget that they plan on it, uh, when they're selling properties and that, you know, that's how they, um, you know, market it. They offer a co-op fee, just like residential real estate or similar to residential real estate, uh, to people. And then number eight is what is the, typically the first income producing property that your clients uh, who have little property management experience exchange into and feel comfortable with. That's kind of a broad question. Um, I think I could do a whole podcast episode on that, you know, mobile home parks, apartment buildings, flex office space, stuff like that definitely kind of require some oversight and, you know, nuanced management, even, you know, two tenant, four tenant, six tenant retail centers, you know, you have to understand the cam process and the management process, stuff like that. But if you, you know, hire one of those that, you know, you buy one of those at a higher cap rate you actually um, can hire a, a property manager who does all that stuff for you, but then you throw in to the equation what I call management risk, and you have some manager you know, managing your asset, looking after your money, who's not doing as good of a job as you would. So uh, you know, I have doctors, lawyers who call me who don't have tons of real estate experience, or you know, I've had a couple clients in the last couple of years who you know, had inherited land and buildings and never managed it, you know, maybe a family member managed it or their parents managed it. And they, um, buy essentially a family dollar, dollar general, I mean, Walgreens, you know, anything with an absolute net lease is kind of a no brainer. I mean, with 15 years on the lease, all you do is get a check. You don't have to do anything. And then, you know, if you're okay with a little bit of management, like a, you know, a tractor supply or, um, Sherwin Williams, stuff like that. You know, fast food is, is, um, absolute net, but going back to like tractor supply, those are double, double net leases where you can get like a, you know, mid six cap and have to be responsible for rough structure parking lot, which is very little management. Uh, but to answer the question broadly, first income producing property with little or no experience, I would just stick to an absolute net deal. If you're okay with a little bit lower cap rate and just what I call is uh, set it and forget it. 
Um, so hopefully, Dave, that uh, answers your questions. And I look forward to speaking with you later this week on the phone. And we can clarify you know, any other items you might have. And then um, hope this was useful to all the listeners out there. So thanks and uh, have a good week. And we'll talk to you soon. Today's show is brought to you by 1031navigator.com. 1031 Navigator is the easiest way to plan and execute your 1031 exchange while saving you both time and money. 1031 Navigator specializes in sourcing passive income properties nationwide, customized to your 1031 replacement needs. Their triple net investment properties produce hands-off passive returns of 5 to 7%, and are secured by investment grade tenants like CVS, Dollar General, and Firestone with 15 to 20 year leases. Get your free personalized 1031 consultation at 1031navigator.com/free.